here. Golden dart frogs use a particular talent to draw in the females. Singing. For a peacock, it's all about the tail. And a tail this grand needs a lot of looking after. It takes more than an occasional dust bath. The National Bird of India spends 50% more time preening than other birds. Not surprising when his clamorous train can reach over five feet long. Having the best tail, in the best condition, with the most eye spots, is the key to success with the ladies. Microscopic structures on the feather's barbs shimmer with spectacular iridescence. Males position themselves in relation to the sun to make sure their feathers look as impressive as possible. If his feathers meet with approval, a male can win a harem of up to five females. But while it's a great courtship strategy, standing out can also attract unwelcome attention from the competition. During mating season, males gather together in an area known as a lek, where they vie for the females. Within the lek, each male has his own small territory. And it's annoying when the neighbors start trespassing on your turf. No self-respecting peacock is going to share. Keeping it clear of intruders can be a full-time job. <laughs> Having successfully defended his patch, now all he needs is the females to turn up. These are the Oyamel fir forests of central Mexico. This unique alpine habitat is a relic from a time when the earth was cooler and wetter. Now, only 2% of the original fir trees remain. Their boughs are heavy, but not with leaves, with millions of monarch butterflies. These individuals belong to a super generation survivors of an incredible 3,000-mile journey that began in Canada and the northern United States. They arrived five months ago and have remained motionless through the winter in a state of dormancy. Like a hibernating bear, they require the warmth of spring to awaken. As the sun's first rays strike, there's no time to waste. They take to the skies in the millions, all synchronized to find a mate. For the females, there's no shortage of options. But for a male monarch in Mexico, finding a partner means the ultimate sacrifice. Whether the males succeed or not, it's their last week on Earth. This is a male, easily identified by the two black spots on his wings. He needs to mate, and soon.
His luck is in. A female. And she's alone. He whisks her away from the surrounding chaos, then injects her with sperm. He also donates a cocktail of nutrients to assist her in pregnancy and her long journey ahead. He loses up to one third of his body weight in the process. An overzealous male can overdo it and cause a female to explode. Not this time. Now carrying hundreds of fertilized eggs, this female and millions of others like her must embark on the second leg of their epic migration. They'll fly 900 miles back north, through Mexico and into the United States. There, they'll find food and a safe place to lay their eggs, which will give rise to the next generation to continue the journey north. As for the male, his journey ends here. His mate has literally sucked the life out of him. But his great-great-grandchildren will be the next super generation. The ones strong enough to fly 3,000 miles back to these ancient fir trees of Michoacan. In the wet season, the abundance of food allows the kinders to spend more time being social. Grooming is a daily pastime, and Simon is giving Madonna some special attention. So I write down any kind of interaction that we see throughout the day. And the reason why we do that is because it can give us an idea of who's interacting with who, um, the kind of relationships they have. Most of the time the relationships are between related individuals like brothers and sisters and mothers and infants, uh, they're juveniles. It's interesting to see if these relationships occur every day or how often they occur. Typically in primates, same-sex individuals use grooming to solidify bonds and affirm hierarchies. But here, it's the relationships between the males and females that are proving so fascinating. Anna has been watching Madonna and Simon closely. The males and the females, they form strong, strong bonds. In other baboons, we see females are the most closely bonded. Here we see, actually, the male-female relationships are stronger than the female-female relationships, which is absolutely something I did not think I would discover. In some other baboon species, the male only shows interest in a female when she's in season. But in kinders, the male is attentive year-round and is the initiator and maintainer of the relationship. This behavior is at the heart of what sets the kinder's mating strategy apart. Simon has seven females to attend to, but at the moment, he's focusing on Madonna. With her hormones elevated and the close proximity of the two new males hanging around, Madonna is rarely sitting still. Much to Simon's frustration. As the alpha male, Coram always gets first bite. He's at the top of a strict ranking system. Next to Eid are Coram's henchmen. High-ranked males, these are his closest allies. They help to keep everyone in line. When the males have had their fill, it's time for the sisterhood. The alpha female and her closest relatives. 
her status was inherited from her mother, a bloodline that's been in power for generations. Finally, the youngsters of the sisterhood get their turn. Everyone literally stuffs their faces. Stuffed cheek pouches almost double the size of the face. It's a clever way to gather food while the going's good. And take it away for later. While life at the top is fruitful, it's a very different story for those at the bottom. Anna is the troop's lowest ranked female. She's around 11 years old, has a distinctive red face, and has spent her whole life being last. Her lowly status is an unfortunate inheritance from her mother. There's no jackfruit breakfast for her. Instead, she forages for roots and grubs. She needs all the food she can find because she's heavily pregnant and due any day. It's been a tough five months, but she's doing the best she can. The Valdivian forest is bursting with natural treasures. Many of them are named after the man who first discovered them, including Darwin's stag beetle. This male is about three and a half inches long, but its ferocious mandibles account for more than half its length. From high in the canopy comes the irresistible smell of a female's pheromones, luring him upwards. Along the way, he breaks for a restorative drink of sap. But he can't stop long. Competition is on its way. Another male drawn to the same seductive scent. The rival takes to the air to make his ascent. They're heading for a treetop showdown. But will either of them have energy left for a fight? Sixty feet up, the stage is set for a clash of the titans. Two males square up to fight. The grappling begins. A kind of beetle jujitsu. The goal? To launch one's opponent from the branch and win the right to mate with the female waiting nearby. The climber hooks his longer mandibles under the flyer and triumphs.
the interloper survives the fall. But he's out of the running. Mantis shrimps have earned themselves a reputation for being somewhat ill-tempered. But scientists have discovered that there's another side to these macho males. This young hopeful is trying to catch the eye of a potential mate. He starts by showing off his paddle-like antennae. His technique may not be very impressive to us, but he is in fact sending the female secret signals. And that is possible because mantis shrimps can see and reflect a kind of light that absolutely no other creature in the world that we know of can see. The male's display is a private invitation for this female to dance. So far, so good. She makes her way to the dance floor. If the male can impress the female with his performance, she will choose him to father her offspring. It seems that this male has all the right moves. The final phase of courtship, however, usually takes place out of sight within their burrows. Today, Raja is ready to take it to the next level. He descends to rouse his bride. Hannah exits cautiously. Today, the king is bold and eager. His sudden change in attitude triggers her into a submissive coil. She presents her body to him for inspection. He's picking up all the right signs that she's receptive. While Hannah's ritual is a slinky display, Male king cobras are far less subtle. Headbutting his queen is the cue that he's ready to mate. The snakes bind themselves together in a tight embrace. Under their leafy canopy, they may lie like this for hours as he fertilizes her. They will mate several times over the coming days. With the onset of the rainy season, the forest echoes with the music of frogs. More than 200 species call Panama home. A male glass frog calls for a mate. And a female responds. Spurred by the rain, they both come down to the stream to engage in an intimate and ancient ritual. These amphibians spend the dry season in the canopy. But once the rains come, it's time to mate. Before mating, the female glass frog walks around on a leaf collecting water, causing her to swell up and hydrate the eggs inside her. When the female releases the eggs, the male catches them with his hind legs and fertilizes them. 
As the eggs develop over the next two weeks, both males and females play important parental roles. One frog takes a turn hydrating the eggs, while the other helps stand guard. Glass frogs may be transparent, but as parents, they're solid as a rock. To study another more elusive bee of the tropical forest, David uses scent baits with odors of winter green, eucalyptus, and clove. And before long, they appear, orchid bees, in all shapes and colors. In Panama alone, there are more than 50 species of orchid bees. They pollinate exotic fruits like tree tomatoes and vanilla. But these bees have come for a different purpose. Male orchid bees collect scent from the paper with their forelegs and rub it into specially designed pouches in their hind legs. By mixing several fragrances together, each species designs its own distinct perfume. And during mating season, each male selects one particular tree and begins his mating ceremony. He perches on the side of the tree and disperses the perfume from his hind legs. If the conditions are right, he might attract a female. Collecting the odors is a way that a male can say exactly how good he has performed. He can't pretend he did more. He can't pretend he's bigger than he is or he's smarter than he is. He's exactly the worth of the odor he's carrying in his leg. And it's a beautiful system. A female can judge what male really she wants to mate with just on that. And if the perfume isn't good enough, it means the male has to collect some more odors. The baits attract many species, among them the biggest of all orchid bees in Panama, Ulima bombiformis. A good two inches long, these bees are known to pollinate Brazil nuts. After 35 years in the field, David can tell more than 250 species apart simply by looking at them. And the results of his long-term study are surprising. I've been looking at this in three big forest preserves in Panama. Nothing's going down. They're not going down in number. So bees are either not changing or they're getting more numerous. They're not more species, they're just more individuals. They're more of them. So something is happening that favors bees and they're actually either surviving better or getting fed more or reproducing more. But it's an unmistakable trend and I've looked at it for 35 years. I know it's really there. There are over 2,000 species of scorpion. And while only around 20 of them are dangerous to humans, all of them are deadly to other bugs. These Tanzanian red claws, like all scorpions, are mainly nocturnal. Their mating rituals generally take place at night. But their bodies fluoresce under ultraviolet light 
and that makes it possible for us to watch their most intimate behavior. When a female finds a male, their extraordinary ritual begins. They dance. He arouses her by caressing her mouth parts. But while he tries to stimulate her, she is testing his strength. She yields. Now he is leading her. Eventually, he deposits his sperm on the ground and gently pulls her onto it. He has proved his strength and agility, and she has ensured the best possible father for her young. A male golden dart frog called Romeo. He too is only a couple of inches long, but here he is a king. He's fought off every other male in a 10-yard radius to claim this best positioned patch of forest as his own. But the losers stay close, waiting for a chance to take what Romeo has won because his crown comes with more than just a territory. By defeating all his rivals, he will get to mate with any female that finds her way here. Golden dart frogs use a particular talent to draw in the females. Singing. Using an air sac like a resonance chamber to amplify the sound, he calls out with a long melodious trill. His loud call intimidates the males hovering on the edge of his territory. More importantly, it carries far beyond the stream and attracts any females who are yet to lay their eggs. A hundred yards away, Julieta hears Romeo's call. She's already on the hunt for a male to fertilize her eggs. Any suitor's call must be strong enough for her to be able to find him in this dense forest. Romeo's song is music to her ears. She can hear him loud and clear, but between them lies a hundred yards of dense and unfamiliar rainforest, strewn with boulders and fallen trees. It's the human equivalent of clambering over 150-foot obstacles for almost three miles. Just finding enough food to fuel this enormous journey will be a huge challenge. But Julieta's biological clock is ticking, so unless she can reach Romeo within just four days, her eggs will be wasted. All at once, groups of tens or even hundreds within the colony will begin an elaborate series of movements, all with the goal of attracting a mate. And the flamboyant flamingos have some fancy dance moves. They start with a head flag, stretching their necks and heads high, bill pointing up and moving their heads from side to side. They then lift their wing in a salute to show off their plumage. 
And finally, the twist preen. Each bird twists its head back and quickly preens. But unlike the macaques of Gibraltar, a flamingo couple will usually mate for life. All the more reason for this single adult female to be picky in choosing her partner. Praying mantises are so named because of their pious looking posture. But these bugs are neither meek nor mild. They're voracious predators. This male mantis climbing up towards his potential mate can have little idea of the danger that he's in. Perhaps put off by the unwelcome advances of the male or simply driven by hunger, the female mantis begins to eat a suitor. Holding his upper body in her left claw, she starts to chew through his thorax. Until the two halves of his body are only held together by a thread of flesh. Eventually, his head drops away. But remarkably, this male isn't entirely dead. He's begun to impregnate her. The female has removed his head and with it the brain cells that control his inhibitions. But his abdomen has its own nerve cells. Cells that control the act of copulation and they allow him to pass on his genes even in the throes of death. In reproductive terms, this male has succeeded, but his death is a symbol of how strangely unfeeling the arthropod world can be. Flying foxes give birth in daylight hours while hanging upside down. The baby emerges head first and is caught in the mother's wings. The baby suckles from a teat in her wing pit. She'll give him milk for at least six weeks after birth. Baby bats, or pups, can't regulate their body temperatures. So it's very important that he stays as close to mum as possible. If it's too cold, she can wrap her wings tightly around the pup. On the days when it's too hot, she can gently fan him with her wing. Sixteen-month-old Rhea and her larger brother Taj have spent their whole lives here on Leopard Rock. 
nurtured and protected by their mother. But now, for the first time, their happy family is about to be rocked. Their mother has come into Estrus. She's ready to mate again. Her alluring aroma has attracted attention. A large male has come into the area to investigate. Adult males only seek out company when they're looking to mate. But encounters are fraught with danger. He could attack any leopard he can't mate with. And over half of leopard cubs are killed by males. So Rhea and Taj's mother has a stark choice to make. She can stay and mate with him here while trying to protect her cubs. Or she can leave to mate elsewhere, drawing the threat away, but leaving Rhea and Taj to fend for themselves. As the big male approaches, the cubs are unaware of their mother's dilemma and the potential danger they're in. They watch as she disappears into the brush with the large male. Over the course of the summer, the yaks have moved to higher ground to escape the heat. The old male has followed them. Adult snow leopards need to make a kill about every 10 days. He becomes part of the landscape, creeping closer. The yaks smell him, but even with their excellent vision, they don't see him. He sets his sights on a youngster that's wandered away. The herd scatters. The leopard won't let go. Then the calf's mother rushes in, risking her own life to save her offspring. The big cat hangs on, but the mother charges again, trying to shake the predator loose. A wingman shows up to boost the defense. It's a remarkable escape, and the leopard slinks off, frustrated. The entire herd gathers around the traumatized youngster. Yaks are incredibly social animals.
Times are tough, especially for this mother. She has cubs to feed. Her son, Kumal, is eight months old and no longer suckling milk. He needs fresh meat. Kumal has watched his mother hunt since he was only five months old. And one day, he will have to provide for himself. In the meantime, he and his sister, Mitra, can eat like kings. This deer will keep the family content for the next few days. At this age, Kumal and Mitra are totally dependent on their mother for food, while their father relentlessly protects them and his territory against intruders. In a takeover, a new male may kill the cubs to sire his own. For now, the jungle is their playground, and Kumal and Mitra spend their days blissfully unaware of the dangers that lie ahead. The northern sea otter thrives in Prince William Sound on the warmer south coast. Here, the waters never get cold enough to freeze over. But even in May, there's still a chilly 40 degrees. It's not exactly a warm and cushy nursery for the colony's most recent arrivals. A handful of newborns. These three-week-old pups are helpless, unable to swim or stay warm on their own. They won't survive without their devoted mothers, who care for the babies single-handedly. Fathers play no part in raising their young. In this protective cove, the retreating tide exposes a small island. The mothers seize the opportunity to turn it into an otter spa. Grooming their pups traps air in their fur which keeps them buoyant and insulates them from the cold. With their pups cleaned and fluffed, the doting mothers return to the sea. It's time to catch dinner. This is the riskiest part of an otter mother's routine. She has to leave her pup unattended. While she hunts for fish, her pup floats like a cork. At this age, he's vulnerable, unable to swim or dive to escape predators. Bald eagles will add otter pup to their diet if they get the chance. This pup's not up for grabs. She'll care for him round the clock for another six months until her pup is weaned and can fend for himself. And only then can one of nature's hardest working mothers take a break. At two months old, they have yet to learn how dangerous their world is. Hyenas and leopards are notorious cub killers. Less than half of lion cubs get to see their first birthday. And even fewer 
make it to adulthood. But the greatest risk of all is from other lions. Roses on edge. A lioness has appeared alarmingly close to the cubs. It's not one Nathan recognizes. Rose is not taking any chances. keeping her distance. I think she got her lesson from the mother having a brief fight and lots of growling. It wasn't a vicious attack by lion standards, suggesting this female is from Rose's own pride, the MKs. If she was a, a female from another pride, I think she would be really aggressive and see her off completely. Most lionesses would have introduced their cubs to the rest of the pride by now. But Rose is a cautious mother and hasn't taken that step yet. She may not be ready, but Spotty, her pluckiest cub, is. I think these cubs are very curious, this other female, who she is, why they're not allowed to go and see her. I'm sure the cubs are very bored of each other and their own mothers, and the chance to play with someone else would be just so, so tempting. This might be the first introduction to another lion. So this is a bit of a new experience, you know, who's this other person? Can we play with them? The cubs seem fascinated with their new playmate. This female from their pride isn't a threat. She may well be their aunt, but Rose is still anxious. With the recent invasion of the nomad males in the valley, the cubs might be better off under the protection of the pride. But for now, Rose is still choosing to keep them hidden. Pythons have lived in Africa for millions of years, long before humans arrived on the scene. The snake we see today has changed little from its prehistoric forebears. It's among the world's most primitive snakes. The small thorn-like projections on their lower body, known as pelvic spurs, are thought to be vestiges of a time when these animals had hind legs. This is Squeeze. A pair of hind legs might actually come in handy right now as she's weighed down by eggs inside her. They've grown to the point where it's hard to make much progress. Each egg weighs about as much as a billiard ball. That's around 50 billiard balls she's been hauling around for weeks. She's ready to lighten her load, but she can't just dump them anywhere. She's been searching for the right spot for weeks. This hollow at the base of an old silver oak tree could provide shelter from the elements hide her eggs from predators, and keep them at a constant temperature.
For an animal capable of such massive displays of power, she can be surprisingly maternal. She arranges her eggs in a pile and coils around them tightly. Of all the snakes in the world, the African rock python is one of only a few that actually cares for its young. All the others simply lay or give birth and leave. Without her protection, Squeeze's eggs would be easy pickings for monitor lizards and mongooses. She'll stand guard for the next 90 days, leaving the hollow only to bask in the sun and return to warm her eggs with her reheated body. Bears are dangerous opportunists. They'll hunt, scavenge, and forage to survive. They'll also attack their own kind. In spring, female bears roam the karst, accompanied by young cubs. They are fiercely protective, especially when faced with a male that would readily kill the cubs to bring the female back into estrus. The male weighs his odds. The young cubs are oblivious to the danger, but their mother goes on the offensive instead of waiting for an attack. The male is not up for the fight. With the threat gone, the young bears devote themselves completely to play. They're learning how to get around in the karst, growing stronger and more confident as they explore. Their mother stays close, teaching them what being a bear is all about. By the time they're two, they'll be on their own. But for now, they're safe under their mother's watchful eye. In March, Meltwater from 70,000 square miles drains into the Yellowstone River. By May, streams begin to swell. With the big melt, bison begin a migration to higher ground. They must cross swollen rivers to reach summer pasture. The calves stay close even when their mothers lead them into dangerous waters. A calf takes the plunge, and instantly, it's in deep water. It takes all of its effort to keep up with its mother. As the rest of the herd piles in, chaos ensues. Lose your footing and the river takes you. Even the strongest are lost. The same current drags the calf down. Maternal instinct is fierce, but so is the river. The cow uses her body as a shield, breaking the current. 
In her lee, the calf makes headway, while others falter. They've escaped the water's deadly grip. The bison herd will continue the journey to higher pastures in the heart of Yellowstone. During a good grooming session, friendships and alliances can be formed. And status reaffirmed. With first time motherhood on the horizon, Sara is curious about the newborns. And she's taken a liking to Anna's son. Sara outranks everyone around her. It means she can do as she pleases, including kidnapping. Anna watches in shock as her son is carried away. Abducting another female's infant is not a typical Tokmakak behavior. But pregnant Sara appears to want to mother Anna's son. Anna doesn't quite know what to do. With her low ranking, she can't just take him back. And the kidnapper is not giving him up. The infant needs to suckle. In this heat, he could quickly become dehydrated. He tries to drink from Sara, but she hasn't got any milk yet. Anna desperately needs to get him back. Among all the bears migrating to Churchill, mothers and cubs travel the slowest. They will be among the last to arrive. The odds of both these newborns surviving their journey is only about 65% so it falls to their mother to do all she can to tip the balance in their favor. Her cubs still lack their layer of insulating fat and are in danger of freezing to death in the frigid water. So she takes frequent breaks to let her cubs dry off in the summer sun. Traveling this way is not only much slower, it's also more dangerous. With hundreds of hungry males already stalking the shoreline, a neglected cub could make for an easy meal. When desperate, polar bears will eat cubs. This male has gone months without a meal. One of polar mom's newborns could be his chance. When Polar Mom stops to give her cubs a break, the male moves in. But Polar Mom catches his scent on the wind without a moment to lose. She runs just far enough, showing him there are no easy grab and go opportunities. 
and the male decides against a lengthy foot chase. But this is a warning to pull her mom. As they continue toward Churchill, her cubs will be safer in deeper cover. The cubs, who are now around four months old, are in great condition. And their mothers also look well fed and healthy. I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, uh, you know, they're doing so well compared to, you know, a few weeks ago with the nomads coming through and chasing everyone around. It's all looking really good for them. Up until now, the mothers have kept their cubs hidden from the rest of the pride. But today, they have visitors. The punks have come to keep an eye on their offspring and are lurking just 60 feet away. So this is the first time we've seen um, the mothers and the cubs and Axel and uh, Mohawk here together. I think this is kind of the beginning of the introduction for the cubs to the rest of the pride. It's quite late, in my opinion, uh, from what I've seen before, but um, it certainly seems to be happening. Ever since the nomads invaded, the mothers have been especially nervous about anyone coming near their cubs. Zuri, first-time mother of two, is far from welcoming. The mom is really snarling at the males, basically telling them to keep away. So they're keeping their distance quite, quite well behaved. The cubs sense her fear. Interesting behavior to watch. Mohawk and Axel just sitting there, you know, looking over, but also at the same time kind of almost looking away as if they're not paying attention. The punks are the fathers of these cubs, so there, there's no real threat there. But um, the mothers are a little bit unsettled moving around. They're, they're not quite at ease at the moment. Axel and Mohawk wisely keep watch from a distance. Oh, there's, a, there's another female over there. It's a lioness from the MK Pride. Unlike the males, she's allowed to approach. So really interesting, the third female came over and joined the mother and cubs, and there was no sign of aggression. They totally accepted it, um, which was fantastic to see. It's not surprising. This new female is Rosa and Zuri's mother, the cubs' grandmother. It's really nice to see that sort of acceptance, and they're very, very calm with each other. Seeing how relaxed they are, Nathan thinks this isn't the first time the cubs have met their grandmother. Because the cubs actually know her well enough that they're not sort of going over and curious, playing and, and sort of seeing who she is. Granny settles in with the newest members of the family. But the fathers will have to be patient a little longer. They can't fly yet, but they can't stay cramped up here either. They understand it's time to jump into a brave new world. The 
sister, the most secretive, returns with four cubs, all males. They're a week or two younger than the twins. Three are full of confidence, but one holds back. He might have been called the runt of the litter in the past, but he's probably just a more tentative character. Each lioness has four teats. Nevertheless, the new cubs are keen to suckle with their older cousins. For the original confident female twin, it's an inconvenience. But for her brother, a lone male, it's salvation. Four new males, cousins. If all survive, they could form a powerful coalition. And he's the eldest, potentially the leader. Lions share suckling duty, called allosuckling. It forges bonds between litters and is the foundation for future prides. First lesson of the day is boyo, or fruit time. Orangutans naturally spend up to six hours a day foraging for food. So breakfast doubles as a perfect learning opportunity. This morning's lesson is in coconut cracking. Orangutans learn from example, so their caregiver shows them how it's done. Mumut, a little male, catches on immediately. While Valentino has a more interpretive approach. With his distinctive pale belly stripe, Valentino is the class clown of Forest School Group 1. What he lacks in technique, he makes up for in exuberance. But when the puzzle proves too hard to crack, Valentino does exactly what he would do if he was in the wild. Asks mum for help. Valentino was found alone in a forest as a baby after his mum was killed. Babysitter Letta is currently his foster mother and she knows Valentino must learn to do this on his own if he's to ever graduate from jungle school. Nearby, the students of Forest Group 2 are incrementally more skillful. It's not so much age that divides Groups 1 and 2, but ability. Little Merrill has learned how to husk her coconut so she can enjoy the sweet milk. But not for long. Opportunistic Valentino moves in to share. He may not be the best at coconut cracking, but learning how to reap the rewards of others' hard work could be an excellent survival skill. Three-year-old Benny has a more laid-back approach. He's exercising his jaws as his powerful teeth scrape the coconut shell but there's not a lot of other energy being exerted. He doesn't even flinch as Meryl helps herself to his leftovers. 
little does Benny know that his expanding girth hasn't gone unnoticed. And he's about to be put on a diet. Wonky Tusk is now the matriarch of a family of five. Her sister, a daughter, a teenage son, and this newly born calf. Elephants with babies are known to be aggressive, but Wonky Tusk seems totally relaxed and undisturbed by Nathan's presence. Ozzy, the barman at the Mufuwe Lodge, witnessed the birth and gave the baby a name. He calls him Wellington. I saw Wellington being born by the, this lagoon you're seeing here. So uh, it's one of the, the elephants which I'm, so far, as long as I'm going to be here, it's the elephant which I'm closely monitoring. Within hours he can walk, but that is about all he can do. Everything else he has to learn from scratch. For the next 14 to 16 years, Wellington will remain with his family. He is totally dependent on their care and instruction for his survival. Few animals form such close and lasting family bonds. They stick together. They care for each other. The family spends about 16 hours a day feeding. In between, there's time to play. Wellington is quick to pick up the important postures in elephant society. He's playing with an older cousin who puffs himself up to look even bigger. But Wellington doesn't fall for the trick. This game is a practice run for the day when these two will have to fight for dominance and the right to mate. Despite his size, Wellington has the upper hand. And the cousin runs back to mommy for protection. Wellington doesn't give up. He drops his head and lowers his trunk. Adults also assume this posture when they get aggressive. Flapping ears and a stiff tail spell danger. He might know all the right moves, but he's still awkward and clumsy. He has a lot to learn. Inside the clinic, a mysterious new arrival waits. Veterinarians Argus and Marios need to assess the new orphan. It's a baby sun bear. The smallest species of all bears. And the only one adapted to the jungles of Southeast Asia. Affectionately named Denny Bear, he was found by local villagers trapped in his flooded ground nest. There was no sign of his mother, so the villagers chose to save him from drowning and brought him to a safe life in captivity. At just two months old, the healthy little bear has an impressive set of climbing claws. isn't the vet's first sun bear. In a 
addition to hundreds of orangutans, the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation also has a temporary sun bear sanctuary at Niaru Menteng. It's home to 16 adult and adolescent sun bears that have nowhere else to go. With resources at Niaru Menteng stretched thin, these bears present a dilemma to the staff. But they'll stay here for now, while a better future for them is planned. <laughs> Delhi bears too small to join the older bears just yet. He'll need to be fed every few hours for the next two months. So he'll stay at the clinic for now, where the staff can nurture him. This place is harsh. The winds can blow 60 miles an hour, and temperatures can drop down to 50 below zero. Blizzards are unpredictable, and in a matter of minutes, you can be lost in a complete whiteout. Not the best conditions to have three kittens. Most of the animals in this part of the country have evolved to sync the birth of their young with warmer weather and spring conditions. While the winter setting might seem like a death sentence for these little kittens, it's really the opposite. The frigid cold actually drives the prey from the high country down into the valley below. It's like having a buffet right at her front door. It was obvious she had several denning areas and caves that she would go to, but then it was really apparent that there was this one cave, this one cave I call the kitty condo. That's kind of her main cave. That's really her home base. I've gone years and traveled thousands of miles looking for mountain lions, and I've barely ever seen one. Finding that cave was huge. I mean, it gave me such an incredible opportunity to set up cameras and film them up close without being intrusive. When I set up on the kills, I really never know what I'm gonna get. I just hope everything's gonna work. That's the boy there, look at him. It's given me a glimpse into the life of a mountain lion family, which is rarely ever filmed and I'm developing an understanding of an animal that is much more than a predator. There's also this soft side to them where they're, they're just a mother taking care of their babies. This is the little moments that I love. Sitting here at their dinner table allows me to see each of their personalities really come through. Like a good mother, Mama Mo keeps the family clean and fed, and even looks after herself a little bit. Eenie is a miniature version of Mama Mo, independent, adventurous, full of courage. And Miney sticks closer to Mom, possessive of Mama Mo's attention. He's the biggest and only male of the kittens, but a complete mama's boy. Amini's name continues to fit perfectly. For a mother to provide food, it's very important. But here's the other thing that this mother provides. Snuggling, loving, cleaning. You just don't, when you think about a mountain lion, you don't think about this side of their life, and this is what they're doing most of the time. <laughs> so it's... She's a new mother, with a hungry baby waiting to suckle. Her baby, called a hoglet, is just a few days old. It was born blind and helpless. Its spines are soft and hair-like at first. 
they only start to harden after a week or two. The hoglet will nurse for about six weeks before going off on its own. At about 10 weeks, it'll undergo a process called quilling, losing its baby quills and growing adult ones like its mom. Wellington's curiosity puts Nathan in a tight spot. The overprotective ant flaps her ears. This is a clear sign that Nathan is trespassing. In the lodge, personal space shrinks. Out here it expands. Either way, it is a negotiation. Wonky Tusk will not hesitate to flatten Nathan or any human that comes between her and her calf. Nathan is fully aware that not even the vehicle can protect him if Wonky Tusk decides to charge. One day, something happens that takes Nathan by surprise. Wellington comes charging over, ears flapping. It's remarkable. Wonky Tusk and the rest of the family do nothing to curb his curiosity. For Nathan, this is a clear indication that elephants learn to fear us. It's not in their nature. In the villages across the river, elephants run away from humans. But Wellington's interaction with Nathan and the people at the lodge has only been peaceful. Nathan is smitten. You do get quite attached to them, uh, which you're not meant to. Uh, well, you try not to, but you know, it's hard not to, because I mean, he's just a you know, very, very cute little character. At the new baby house, where the youngest orphans now live, everyone seems enthusiastic about the different morning routine. But once the doors open, the bravado vanishes, and many of the nursery babies cling to each other for comfort, as they're still getting used to their new home. This morning, Jellapat's missing his usual hug buddy, Telecan. So he's brought his security blanket along. Everyone rides the wheelbarrow buses for another day in the forest. Two miles away, at the main Niari Menteng compound, the older classes are already filing into the forest for the day's lessons. Hanin holds up her classmates for a bathroom break. Orangutan style. Chinta deals with the roadblock with her signature move. The group two students pile onto their platform as babysitter Letta constructs one of the famous fruit kebabs the team uses to encourage the students to forage in the trees. <laughs> Class clown Valentino has a love-hate relationship with this lesson. Over the past few months, trying to grab moving fruit has frustrated him enormously. He makes a token effort today. But Valentino has no patience for this. 
And so he goes straight to the source. A dozen wood ducks are ready to hatch. All the chicks are born alert and with a full coat of down. They can't fly yet, but they can't stay cramped up here either. After only one day, Mom calls for them to boldly go where they've never gone before. Even at this young age, they understand it's time to jump into a brave new world. It's a 30-foot leap of faith. The first brave soul prepares for liftoff. One down. And its brothers and sisters wait in the wings. Typically, all the chicks will jump just minutes apart. But every now and then, there's a failure to launch. Houston, we have a problem. The Eagle has landed. stops to give her cubs a break, the male moves in. But Polar Mom catches his scent on the wind without a moment to lose. Mother Bear has settled into her narrow cavern, protecting her cubs through the minus 40 degree winter. The infant cubs have never seen the sun. 
but will soon emerge at about 10 weeks. Trading the safety of the den for the dangers of the outside world. The tiny cups take their first steps into the world. Everything is new. just 20 pounds, they'll need to grow and gain strength in a hurry. Soon, they'll begin an epic trek out onto the ice so mom can feed again. Winter comes early to Yellowstone. This is the season of the wolf. While others battle the elements, wolves are in their prime. Their success is tied to the collective strength of the pack. A curious adolescent named Blacktail. Like many young males, he's left behind the security of his pack. Winter's wrath could be fatal for a lone wolf. In this lean season, every meal is critical. And hiding among the willows is what looks like a perfect opportunity. A wounded bull elk, half frozen at the water's edge. A wolf pack would go straight for the kill. But alone, Blacktail has almost no chance of taking it down. He must wait until the bull gives out. But time is not in his favor. Far across the valley, a legion is gathering the Wapiti Pack. More than 20 wolves strong, they travel in formation, searching for prey. They follow the river, unhurried, until in unison, they spot something. The wounded elk. Blacktail holds his ground in the meadow. He can't afford to abandon this chance of a meal. The Wapitis gather in the timber. They're staging for an ambush, just as night is falling. The sun rises on what little remains of the old bull elk. The Wapiti's night ambush was a success. 20 wolves fed on their prize and vanished, leaving only scraps for ravens and coyotes. Blacktail is nowhere to be seen. At 11,500 feet above sea level, Ladakh is home to about 2,000 Kiangs, including Dorje and his herd. Winter on the plateau is brutal. The temperature drops to negative 22 degrees. Up here, the air is thin. There's only half as much oxygen as at sea level. But Dorje and his herd are well adapted to these punishing conditions. 
They are smaller than their horse and zebra cousins, standing only four feet tall at the shoulder. But males can weigh a thousand pounds. Thick woolly hair helps insulate their short stocky bodies. And sturdy hooves help them navigate the rugged terrain. The herd moves constantly in search of food. There's little available except tough needle grass, which can survive the freezing temperatures by lying dormant. Its dry stalks are resistant to frost damage, but hold little nutrition. In winter, when other food is scarce, this coarse grass makes up more than 90% of the Kiang's diet. But other options do exist, if you know where to look. Dorje digs to uncover small dormant plants with shallow roots just under the surface. Like the needle grass, the roots he finds are tough and fibrous. For most grazers, this diet would hold few nutrients. But Kiangs have evolved a digestive system far more efficient than most of their equine relatives. And they can survive on these meager pickings, if they can get enough of them. Digging is hard work so Dorje is not about to share. On the outskirts of town, a new mom and her cub look for a place to rest. It's been a long journey since the six-year-old female gave birth to her first litter 30 miles inland. In March, she led her cubs on a trek back to the seal hunting grounds on the ice. But the grueling trip was too much for one cub didn't survive. With food hard to come by at this time of year, the two scour the beach for any carry-on washed in with the tide. Today's their lucky day. New Mom discovers a fish carcass. It's not much, but she can't be choosy. She's burning through two pounds a day nursing her cub. January brings a fresh coating of snow to the upper peninsula of Michigan. And plenty of it. It's lake effect snow, whipped up by moisture from the open waters of Lake Superior to the north and Lake Michigan to the south. More than five feet can fall in January alone, making the region one of the heaviest snow belts in the nation. It takes a special breed of animal to handle a Michigan winter. This river otter is up to her eyeballs in personal maintenance.
Rolling in snow keeps her fur clean and allows it to trap an insulating layer of air in her woolly undercoat. She can't survive these conditions without it. Now that she's taken care of her coat, it's her belly that needs attention. The hungry otter relies on this stretch of open water for her winter pantry. The river is freezing up fast, but so far, the current is strong enough to fend off the ice. She hunts the frigid waters, protected by her outer coat of waterproof fur. She hits pay dirt, a school of small fish sluggish from the cold. In between meals, she works to combat winter's advance, keeping a series of holes open in the ice. If they close over, she could lose her access to the fish and starve. Worse, she could find herself without an easy exit and become trapped under the ice. Hard work and the right gear take the bite out of winter. Native to Antarctica, the seals number about 800,000, and they're the only mammals that live this close to the South Pole year round. The first thing Lang discovers is how incredibly resilient these seals are. The Waddells are able to hold their breath for over an hour and have been spotted at depths exceeding 2,000 feet, something no human ever could match without a submarine. In a world as harsh as this, these gentle creatures spend the majority of their lives foraging for whatever food they can find. That includes fish and small invertebrates unlucky enough to be caught by these warm-blooded torpedoes. In fact, the seals only surface to breathe, rest, and give birth to their pups. The Weddell seals have an ability to store quite a bit more oxygen in their blood. By taking repeated long duration breath, they're decreasing the amount of nitrogen in their system, and they're increasing the amount of oxygen capacity within their blood. The Waddell seals' diving abilities help protect them from killer whales and other predators. Several miles of permanently frozen seas separate the shoreline from the open water, and scientists have learned that since predators are unable to hold their breath long enough to pursue the seals under this ice, this area becomes the Waddell's safe zone. This place is harsh. The winds can blow 60 miles an hour, and temperatures can drop down to 50 below zero. Blizzards are unpredictable, and in a matter of minutes, you can be lost in a complete whiteout. Not the best conditions to have three kittens. Most of the animals in this part of the country have evolved to sync the birth of their young with warmer weather and spring conditions. While the winter setting might seem like a death sentence for these little kittens, it's really the opposite. The frigid cold actually drives the prey from the high country down into the valley below. It's like having a buffet right at her front door. It was obvious she had several denning areas and caves that she would go to, but then it was really apparent that there was this one cave 
this one cave I call the Kitty Condo. That's kind of her main cave. That's really her home base. I've gone years and traveled thousands of miles looking for mountain lions, and I've barely ever seen one. Finding that cave was huge. I mean, it gave me such an incredible opportunity to set up cameras and film them up close without being intrusive. When I set up on the kills, I really never know what I'm gonna get. I just hope everything's gonna work. And that's the boy there, look at him. It's given me a glimpse into the life of a mountain lion family, which is rarely ever filmed. And I'm developing an understanding of an animal that is much more than a predator. There's also this soft side to them where they're, they're just a mother taking care of their babies. This is the little moments that I love. Sitting here at their dinner table allows me to see each of their personalities really come through. Like a good mother, Mama Mo keeps the family clean and fed and even looks after herself a little bit. Eenie is a miniature version of Mama Mo, independent, adventurous, full of courage. And Miney sticks closer to Mom, possessive of Mama Mo's attention. He's the biggest and only male of the kittens, but a complete mama's boy. And Meanie's name continues to fit perfectly. For a mother to provide food, it's very important. But here's the other thing that this mother provides. Snuggling, loving, cleaning. You just don't, when you think about a mountain lion, you don't think about this side of their life, and this is what they're doing most of the time. <laughs> so he's. Among all the bears migrating to Churchill, mothers and cubs travel the slowest. They will be among the last to arrive. The odds of both these newborns surviving their journey is only about 65%. So it falls to their mother to do all she can to tip the balance in their favor. Her cubs still lack their layer of insulating fat and are in danger of freezing to death in the frigid water. So she takes frequent breaks to let her cubs dry off in the summer sun. Traveling this way is not only much slower, it's also more dangerous. With hundreds of hungry males already stalking the shoreline, a neglected cub could make for an easy meal. When desperate, polar bears will eat cubs. This male has gone months without a meal. One of polar mom's newborns could be his chance. When Polar Mom stops to give her cubs a break, the male moves in. But Polar Mom catches his scent on the wind without a moment to lose. She runs just far enough, showing him there are no easy grab and go opportunities. and the male decides against a lengthy foot chase. But this is a warning to Polar Mom. As they continue toward Churchill, her cubs will be safer in deeper cover. <laughs> 